All right, so first order, uh, I'd like to open the meeting of the Wakefield Conservation Commission for April uh, 23rd, 2020. And uh, first item, um, let's see, roll call. We have myself, we have Frank, we have Teresa, we have Nini. So we do have four individuals that are members. Um, we have a new member that will be joining us. Uh, Ken Alepides will be joining us in May. Uh, he was voted oh. into the uh, commission um, last Monday. Uh, I see Peter Miller has just joined us also. So we do have five commissioners here. Peter, can you hear us? I can hear you. I can hear you. I can only see you. Am I supposed to be able to see others? Yes. Oh, I is see. it gallery gallery option? Ah, okay. Hang on for a second. Yeah. And we, and we can't see you, Peter. Okay. Well, that's a, that's kind of an advantage for you guys. Um, I'll see what I can do about that, though. Oh, maybe if I start the video, that would help. Oh, you are. And okay, okay. I see Frank. Okay. Now I got to find that gallery option. Okay. Content participants. Ah, I see. There we go. Okay. Hmm. All right. We keep working on this. So, how do I get to the gallery option, you guys? I don't want to sound like a dope, but. Uh... Yeah, mine just actually launched that way. Um... What happens if you go to the participant uh, button in the bottom? I have it at the top and it says participants. As, exactly. It just says invite. Wait, now I have more. There's a more button. Meeting settings. How about that? Um, Hey, there's a thing that says touch up my appearance. I should be thinking on that for sure. <laughs> yeah, we could all use that. <laughs> Maybe I should just get a picture of Brad Pitt or something. All elective surgeries have been put on hold until this COVID-19 thing is over. <laughs> says show non-video participants on. Um, oh, wait, show non-video. Okay, non-video participants. Okay. Closed captioning, always show meeting controls. Let's see what that is. I like that. I like this touch up in my appearance. That's pretty funny. See what it says. Um, so I'm going to say that's done. Oh, you know what? I just pushed a uh, button and got and got everyone. I'm sorry now. I've got. Um, all right, I'm doing better now. Okay, you good? I'm better. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry to waste everyone's time. No problem. No problem. This is all a, a new experience for uh, many of us. Um, I've not used Zoom. I've used Teams many times, but not uh, Zoom. Um, all right. So next thing, um, I would like to also mention that uh, we did lose our chair, Jimmy Luciani. Um, you know, Jimmy was a 37-year member of the commission. Uh, chair per, I'm gonna guess maybe about the last 20 years or so. Uh, in addition to being a 37 year member of the commission, Jimmy was an instrumental member of the War Memorial uh, Rebuild Project and also a member of the Lake Hugh Review uh, Committee. Um, you know, a couple things about Jimmy. You know, I really don't know of anybody um, that has served this town, you know, with more dedication, generosity and care. Uh, than the Jimmy has, um, you know, lifelong resident, Wakefield High grad, uh, went to Wentworth, uh, engineer degree, master carpenter, uh, builder, developer, and uh, like I said, a lifelong friend of the town of Wakefield. So thank you, Jimmy, uh, for your service. Uh, we definitely will miss your dedication, your expertise, uh, and everything else you brought to the commission. 
Uh, first thing well, up is the point of a motion, but I second that. Yeah, well, well said, Bob. Good job. Yes, thank you. He'll yeah. be simply missed. Agreed. Uh, wholeheartedly agreed. Thank you. Uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from March 12th. If you can remember back that far. I wasn't there, so I can't approve them. Sorry. And Mickey's not here, is he? No. no. Can you guys see the minutes? Yes. Yes, I can. That's well done. I did a quick read through. Um, if, if you want a second to read through, feel free, but I'll, I'll make a motion to um, accept the minutes. I'll second. All in favor? Let's see. There is a raise hand button, or I can watch you raise your hands. Is there a raise hand button? There is a raise hand button, but actually, now that you're sharing your screen, I cannot see that. Oh. I don't see it either. Um, and we could well, always. You can so do actually, a voice, but you need you need many to, you need me to uh, agree. I will. We will need yep. that for. Uh, I I just raised my hand. So. Okay. <laughs> So all in favor, that was Frank, Nini, yep. Peter, and myself. Yes. And Teresa is abstaining. So we, uh, that motion moves. And okay. Do we have our new member? Do we have our new member tonight? I'm sorry. No, we do not yet. I think it's actually effective May 1st. Um, okay. Yeah, Ken Elliptides is not with us on this call. Uh, this, you know, meeting, but I believe it's May 1st. We actually, uh, starts. Is town hall open for him to swear in? I'm not sure how they're doing that swearing process. If they have a remote process for that, or if it's just six feet away type of thing, but yes, he will obviously need to be sworn in, um, you know, receive his letter and be sworn in. All right. First up is, uh, nine Robert street. Um, the request for determination of applicability. Um, I believe we left this off looking for a planting plan. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm here on uh, 9 Robert Street. Okay. Is, uh, Judy, is that how we left off with that, looking for a planting plan? Yeah, he is going to work with Elaine on that. Okay. I'm give him some suggestions. It was mainly just to formalize the tree removal. Right. So um, I think that uh, probably the best thing to do would be, um, Mr. McAleese, have you uh, uh, developed any kind of a landscaping plan? Uh, so I started to remove the, uh, the, the chippings and stuff because I got all the stumps grinded down. Uh, a lot of the roots were removed. Um, as far as just other than just the uh, the, the, um, the grinding's being removed. I, I haven't really done much of any of that. All right. So then what I will do is I'll put together a planting plan and send it to you. And uh, then you can get back to me and um, give me an idea of what's feasible. And uh, uh, I can come out and take a look at it. And um, just so I have it, because it's difficult to get into the office, could you give me your telephone number again? Yeah, it's 774. Yeah. Six, uh, six, eight, eight. Yeah. Nine, zero, eight, eight. All right. And your email is, uh, my first name, Robert, uh, dot, my last name, M A C A L E E S E at gmail.com. All right. I'll get something to you in the week and, uh, uh, it'll be just in time for planting season. Perfect. Any uh, suggestions for grass? Cause my grass is dying. Your grass is dying. It's early in the season for your grass to be dying. Well, I just I feel like it's getting taken over by weeds, and um, a lot of the stuff's getting pushed out. Well, I tell you now that um, it's lot. The, there's a lot of canopy gone there. Why don't um, I just come take a look along with the rest of the landscaping plan? Sounds good. Okay. I see from the minutes that it says here that um, the commission concurred that a request for determination of applicability was needed to be filed. Was that done? 
That's this. Yeah, the, it was filed. That's okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry. There's actually um, a company, Black Earth um, Composting, and they sell compost. So it may, it may be some way to get soil from if you aerate the area and then add the soil. Okay. Because they deliver locally. I mean, maybe something to look at. What was the name of the company? Black Earth. Black Earth. I'll remember that. I can't find the pen. I, I'll email it to you. Perfect. I appreciate that. Okay. And is there anything else for 9 Robert Street? Did you we not see that RDA? What's that? Judy, so you, have to, you have to vote on it. Did we did that come via email? How did we did we see that? Um, you didn't because it's in the office. Yeah, I, that's why I, I didn't remember seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. No, because it was just the tree removal and to develop a planting plan. So I'll do it online because I, it'll have to be filed online and I'll send it around so you can see it because I'll have to print it and then you'll have to sign it. So I'll have to bring it around and get everyone to sign. So what okay. we had talked about um, back on March 12th, I believe, was issuing a negative determination of applicability um, and requesting the planting plan. Is that, uh, is that correct? Yes. So uh, we never voted on that, did we? Nope. All right, so do we have a motion? We need to see it first. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I want to see it. I'm sorry. That makes me, I want to see it too. Palm trees. I want palm trees in there. <laughs> okay. Tap die. All right, we will hold off on uh, voting on the determination uh, and issuing that until we get the planting plan all resolved. No, they want to see, you want to see the request, don't you? I want to see the request. Yeah, no, that's oh, fine. Okay. So we'll just push it to the next meeting. That's fine. Yeah. I think it's easy. I think it's, we just need to make it official. It is. Yep. Yep. All right. I'll put it together and send it. I'll have a planting plan that can be sent around electronically at the same time. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, then. Uh, moving on. Just check the time. Actually, it is 7.15, so we can start with DEP file 313582. It's a continuation of Lovis Ave extension. Uh, John, I saw, thought I saw John, oh, there he is, John Ogren. Okay. John, you're up. Um, well, as far as I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, as far as I understand it, uh, last we were waiting for was um, the report from Oxbow Associates and um, I, that was received, I believe, uh, earlier this week. And basically, the commission wanted to discuss um, the findings of that report, I believe. Right. Did, did everybody get a copy of that report or get a chance to review it? Yes. 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 I do have some questions. Um, Peter, did you have a chance to see it? Peter's muted. Yes, I I did have it. Um, yeah, both I have a copy. All right, uh, Nini, have you uh, re also seen it? Yep. Okay, great. All right, go ahead. Uh, who was that, Frank? That had the questions. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the file now. I have it. I made some comments on the PDF file. Okay. Um, John, did you have a chance to review it? John Ogren. I did review it. Yes. Do you have any uh, comments on, while well, I'm looking it up, do you have any comments on the findings? Um, not in terms of the, the wildlife that was um, documented out there, no. And um, the author of that, Scott, is, is on the line. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, Hi, he is. Hello. Hello, Scott. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, just give me one minute. Yeah, 
just let me know if you have any questions. All right, I could probably share my screen and go through some of my comments here. Let's see. Hey, go ahead, Frank. All right, so this is the report. Can you guys see that? Yes. Got it. Okay. So a couple of things. One was related to the, it looks like it was related to the vernal pool. And, and, and just let me know if this was the only, you know, the only property of the area that excluded it from being a vernal pool, but it says that the, you know, the wood frog callings were not robust enough. And is that, is that a seasonal thing, do you think? Or, you know, what what is that based on? Is there a decibel level or yeah, how, you know, how qualitative was that? And could that be changed in, in a different season? That's a good question. Um, when frogs are calling, you, you can obviously, to anyone who hears them, if you don't hear any, that's, that's one extreme. And if you hear so many calling that you can't tell how many there are, uh, then that's called a full chorus. Um, and the recording that I was able to get that uh, afternoon, a couple of recordings, it, it was not at a full chorus. Um, so when I submitted it to the state, they said it's, uh, they, it, it wasn't robust enough. It didn't have enough frogs calling all at the same time. If I had come back that evening and tried to make the recording and I, the weather, weather was right, it, it may have been plenty loud enough, but but I'm not sure. I, you know, I could only go out there so many times. Right. And on what day did you do this? It was March. That was on the second visit. That was March 18th. March 18th. Do you, if you came back in July, would that be different? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't hear any calling at that point. It's usually oh, okay. very early spring for for that particular species, the wood okay. frogs. Usually, Which time of day was that, Scott? And does that matter? That, that was on March 18th. Right, was that when in the morning or was, was that in the evening or like? Oh, what instance, time of day? Sorry, I didn't yeah. hear that. Yeah, that was in the afternoon. Okay. Um, like I noticed the peepers and the tree frogs where I'm at in the evening, but I don't know actually if they're loud during the day because I'm usually not here during the day. Right. So well, uh, yeah, you could uh, you could be. I, I'm I can't say for sure, and I'm a scientist, so I like to base things on evidence, right? But I would predict that at some point the call the frogs were calling much louder on warmer evenings. But we have to base it on the evidence. So we looked around a lot for uh, finding frogs, and if you look at this wetland, it has a lot of uh, this one. Uh, particular kind of vegetation called uh, swamp uh, swamp willow or decadon uh, verticillatus uh, swamp loosestrife it's called and it's not easy to sneak up on frogs it's very noisy and a lot of dense vegetation so that had something to do with it too um, and but then when we went back we did find the spotted salamander egg masses which is another uh, amphibian that specializes in seasonal ponds. So I think that that's another good indicator. But again, with only three egg masses, that isn't enough to actually certify the vernal pool um, based on the, the criteria for certification in the state of Massachusetts. Okay, but we're, a, I mean, we're pretty close. And I mean, yeah. I would say that this is a pretty important um, habitat area. It does it may not rise to the level of vernal pool, but you know, it, it, it is a robust area for habitat and, you know, salamanders and. It, it is, and it, it, the, it has all the ingredients. And that's what I tried to make the point of in my report that you have a, a, an upland forest that hasn't been cut over in 
decades if it, you know it seems like the trees are fairly mature in that area uh, and then you have a extensive wetland uh, that protrudes onto the western part of the pro property but extends further to the west and then also the wetland to the east off site that's another uh, wetland system that is relatively extensive for uh, towns like Wakefield you know, suburban Boston uh, it's a lot of a lot of open land in there compared to a lot of places that I work. Right, and that land is in that upland area is important in species going on across, connecting the two areas of wetland. Correct. Yes, both connecting and as their non-breeding habitat. So uh, these particular amphibians, the spotted salamanders specifically, spend like ninety-nine percent of their lives in uplands but they need those wetlands to breed in and to lay their eggs and for their larva to develop over the spring and summer. But most of the time is spent underground in uplands hundreds of feet away from wetlands usually. So I'm gonna ask a question later, but um, I'll tell you what that question is first. It, it, you know, the question ultimately is gonna be, is the 25 foot no disturb zone adequate to protect these species? So you don't have to answer that yet because I have a couple of other questions I wanna ask, but that's gonna be the, the last question I ask. Um, so let me just see what wrote here. Um, so it says reviewed, which does not propose any direct impacts to wetland resources and provides a 25 foot no disturb zone. This zone will provide some habitat value and filtering functions. So my question is, does that result in disturbance of that area outside the 25 foot, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is just a 25 foot no disturb zone. And then it says in the remaining 25 to 100 foot portion of the buffer zone, all this work is done. Um, the question is, will that work outside of the 25 foot zone? And maybe I just got to the question sooner than I thought I would, but um, is an alteration expected if you are doing work beyond that 25 foot buffer zone? And a follow up question to that would be what, you know, what would be the the, zone, the, the buffer zone that would be recommended to minimize impacts to the wetland. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, as far as look, biologically speaking, yeah, I, I like to break these down into biologically and uh, regulatory wise, right? So biologically speaking, uh, both of these species, wood frogs and spotted salamanders you know, are, uh, will use upland forest within five to 600 feet of the wetlands, right? So some of them will go a short distance and some of them will go long distances and spend their summers in those areas far away. But that's not regulatory wise, right? You're only, you can only deal with the 100 foot buffer zone associated with it. Correct. So in, and in that buffer zones under the state regulations are very, uh, they aren't their own resource area, right? They're a buffer zone to a resource area so that if, if there's a washout that everybody could understand and, and, and uh, erosion and it flows down into the wetland, that's an impact that happened in the buffer zone, but it ended up in the wetland area. In this case, we have species that are dependent on the wetland and dependent on the upland without a much more extensive study. We don't know what the, if those particular individuals are going to the area that's going to be impacted, but we do know that they're going within that 100 feet, probably within two, 300 feet, and then coming going back and forth. Uh, but some of them could be living on areas that are outside the property. We don't know for sure. So it's speculation to really say for sure if there will be an indirect impact to those species, but I think the likelihood is fairly high that there will be an impact. So in other words, if you removed all the forest, cut it completely off, there would likely not be uh, those same, those same uh, species c coming back the next year because their habitat would have been removed. Okay. So it's like an indirect and hypothetical argument. Right, but you would, you, you did say too, and we said it earlier that the area east of, of that wetland is important because it's a migration area between the, the two resource areas. Right. Okay. And I, and I do like uh, on the very northern end of that uh, 
they do have a setback proposed um, that will provide some connectivity between to, from across that site from east to west or west to east. And, right up in this area. Yeah. Okay. And it'll be it's it, it's good that there's some there. You know, the bigger the better for the for the species, the amphibian species in, in that area. Okay. So we've talked about the spotted salamanders and frogs. It says that thus in order to adequately protect the amphibian community, upland must be preserved as well as wetlands. Right. So that, that's a pretty strong statement. And you know, uplands, I, I don't know if you define that exactly, but um, you know, it, is this under the Wetlands Protection Act? Um, you know, in holding the you know the interests of the act in mind, or you know, to what level are you making the statement? Is this a regulatory statement? Or is this more related to the specific, you know, the specific? Um, right. That, you know, that's a good. That's a good question. So uh, that that's more of a biological statement because if we really wanted to protect every amphibian that's possibly using that area, you wouldn't allow any sort of development within 600 feet of there. But that's unrealistic and not part of the regulations. So you need to protect some uplands, and they'll have a chance. The more, the better. The more, the better. Okay. You know, again, we have, um, and, and this is kind of the, you know, the last question I'll ask is, um, you know, we should inquire if the applicant can provide a larger setback. And, you know, based on your expertise, what would be a realistic, reasonable setback on this project to, um, you know, to use, uh, we, you know, we have a, a 25 foot no disturb policy. And so mm -hmm. we don't have a, um, you know, we don't have a bylaw that states that, but, you know, most of the folks who work with us honor that uh, when feasible. Um, and, but, you know, we look at that as a, you know, we have some science to back that up and we establish that and that's good for your average project. So this seems a little bit more sensitive than your average project. So my question is, what, what is the right number? And that's, you know, we struggle with that. Uh, we probably spent, you know, a lot, uh, way too much time going back and forth on that. Um, ultimately, we came to the decision to, you know, bring in your expertise to um, ultimately opine on that, uh, on that number. And is 25 feet enough um, on this project? Well, I've seen I've I've seen a lot of projects that don't allow for 25 feet and go right up to the edge of wetlands, and so I sometimes 25 feet is is uh, much better than nothing. But in this case, I think it it, it definitely the the more the better it would be great, but it has to be factored into the regulations that you're dealing with, the policy that you're dealing with. I mean, I work a lot of times as an applicant, you know, representing applicants on projects like this, and I have to be consistent in how I approach these uh, projects. So I think that yeah, asking the, the, yeah, and asking the, the applicant to restrict it more to, you know, 35 feet or keep it 25 feet or maybe even less than 20 feet on some places, but then expand it more in other places, perhaps there could be some but I, I'm not aware of the geometric constraints that they're under uh, related to other setbacks and other uh, town uh, 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 boards and committees. Yeah, uh, I mean, I do want your answer to be independent of any any other you know rules associated right. with development. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I can't give you a, a solid number that that magically uh, solves all the amphibian problems for this particular uh, site. Um, like I said before, if we really wanted to be 100% certain, it would be closer to 600 feet. That's what a lot of the studies have shown that the average you know, population will stay within 600 feet. But that's not what we have in the Massachusetts regulations. And if you don't have a bylaw, you can't protect the buffer zone much more than uh, is obvious to protect the adjacent resources. And so what I have seen be successful in cases like this though, is if there was a way to maybe keep that 25 foot, but then 
or be somewhat flexible with that and, and then be able to move that northern edge down and make a larger corridor in that northern edge, uh, that, that could be something that, that I think would be, would be favorable. I don't know if you have the project plans, like where they show the actual development and that setback up on that northern edge. That might be helpful to look at. Yeah, that's one thing I don't have here. Um, Elaine, is there a way, do we have that electronically? Or John, do you have a means to share that? Um, I, I do have a PDF of it. I don't know how to share it with you though. So while John's looking that up, any other members of the commission wanna, wanna so comment on that? There was a, um, I do, um, Bob and Frank. Um, the follow-up follow question about, just if you can address more about the, um, the, the removal of uh, 120 trees and what that will do. Um, and I know you, you touched on it, but can you, um, you know, and what it'll do to increase, um, you know, water on the property, because um, you're losing all of that uh, take the trees. Um, so if you could address that, that'd be great. We, yeah, we did ask Scott that uh, exact question. Um, I do have his response on the, um, you know, report that came back out and, and I can read that and then Scott can uh, comment further. Uh, removal of trees, saplings and shrubs, uh, reduce shade. Will change the moisture and temperature of the understory and forest floor, an adjacent wetland within the shade zone of the cleared forest. Presuming stormwater system is designed correctly, um, I do not believe this will negatively affect the wetland, but it could lead to an increase in invasive species along the edge of the cleared area. Right. So, it, yeah, just what I just add to that is you know, removing of the trees is one thing, but I wanted to make clear that. It's not, they're not just removing the trees and then letting it grow back, right? I mean, the, the right. taking the soil away and building a road, uh, building the houses, et cetera. But they have a stormwater system that is presumably designed to accommodate uh, all of the runoff that would be in that location um, and, 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 and control that. So, but the trees de definitely provide a lot of evapotranspiration uh, and uh, removing that water, but it's my understanding from an engineering perspective that they factor in the cover type that's on the site that they're going to be working in and the soil type that's on the site that they're going to be working in. But what they don't include is uh, creating a lot more edge habitat when you remove a forest, then you have an edge of a forest that's going to be along that 25 foot no touch area. And if that isn't uh, maintained uh, regularly, then it could be a place where invasive species uh, tend to get a hold, uh, take hold of, of that recently disturbed soil and then spread into the wetland or into the adjacent forests. So that's a, another indirect concern, but it can be remedied uh, during the uh, oversight of the project in the early stages of growing everything growing back. And how can that be remedied, Scott? Well, with some construction monitoring and uh, photographs and reporting it to the Conservation Commission. And then if the, and then if you do have invasive species, then you can try to get rid of them, whatever methods are approved of in the town. If it's just a few, you can just pull them up by hand. If it takes hold more then perhaps herbicides might be in order. So, I guess a comment. Um, I have seen a few places around town where development has occurred uh, similar to this, where for some reason the water levels seem to be higher than they were uh, before, and we have a lot of trees dying off, I believe, because of the higher water levels. The oaks, especially, are, are you know rotting out and dropping. Could the loss of 124 trees? and the water uptake that they would provide result in an increase in water level in the wetland and therefore a dying off of those trees that cannot handle the wet conditions as well. It is possible, but most of this wetland is 
only the fringe of it is forested. Most of it's open because it's already so wet that trees can't survive out there anyway for most of the year. Okay. Sure, later in the summer it draws down and is perhaps mostly dry, but for a lot of the years, I think it has probably two, three, even four feet of water in it. So it could, could have some effects on the trees around the edges, but uh, like I said, if the stormwater system is designed appro appro appropriately, it will not have uh, a major, uh, it, it should be controlling, what do they call it, the peak rate and the peak volume coming off of the site. But that's a question for the engineer. John, do you think you've, uh, um, you know, really mitigated for the loss of the trees in the buffer zone and the water uptake that they would provide? Well, I wouldn't say in terms of, um, there's, I don't know of any way to quantify the uptake of the trees, but certainly from the ground cover standpoint, um, that's used in the analysis analysis in the drainage study that's done and um, basically you look at both the rate and the, the volume of runoff from the site in the existing and proposed condition. You know in a, in a convoluted way I guess um, the house on lot uh, two that's one closest to the wetland correct lot two? Is that lot one? Yeah, lot two. Lot two. We'll actually provide some canopy, um, seeing that's a north-south facing house. The height of that house will actually provide some canopy, which could offset some of the loss of canopy in that area. How high is that house intended on this, as of right now, John? Do we even know? No, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm anticipating it's you know pretty much your typical two and a half story you know, colonial type house. So we could be 20, 25, depending on whether it has a walkout, but now it could even be uh, 25, 30 feet tall, potentially. Yeah, probably close to 30 feet on the back side, I would say. You know, and one, one of the things that the, we talked about with the commission to try to um, improve and maybe get some additional um, buffer is on that lot too, we looked at um, the area just to the right of the house, putting in a, a retaining wall and trying to preserve in its natural state um, a, a portion of that lot. Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. John, can you point to the portion of the plan where you're talking about? Yeah. You're attacking that mouse. I don't know what's going on. Here we go. Yeah, but that's not the one. <laughs> that was, that's the older version. Yeah, so on lot two, do you guys see this plan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, on lot two, this is the one that we adjusted the house to kind of to pull it a little further away from the 25 foot um, 
no disturb. And then in this area in here, um, we had had grading prior. Um, we took that grading out and put a retaining wall along the edge of the uh, roadway and down and back into the house to basically to take this area here and preserve the, what trees we put in this area and basically keep it um, in its natural state that we won't be disturbing that area. Okay. Okay. So, John, is that is that a new proposal that you're? This Peter is it a new proposal that you're making, or is that? Um, it was the no, last we, just, we discussed that at the last hearing. Which okay, okay, yeah. it's not new. It's just some. It's something that you know has evolved through. Okay. No, no, no. I'm just trying to understand what. Yeah. Um, and and it sounded like it sounded like from the report. The report seemed to suggest that the the more sensitivity was at the northern boundary of the right. property. And, and um, can you talk a little bit more about where you want um, Scott? Yeah. What are the northern boundary? What do you suggest happening on the northern boundary? Yeah, up there. Up yeah, there. So yeah. yeah. Um, well, what are those? Are, are, Go ahead. I'm are, sorry. Are those infiltration systems? Those two rectangles there. Yeah, that's for the, the roof infiltration. Right. Yeah. And then um, I assume that would be that would be backyard there too. Oh my beauty. Yeah. That would be lawn in the back of the house. Yeah. You know, one point on my the migration, I, I mean I'm assuming that for the most part they're gonna take the the easiest route between these the two wetlands. Um, and if you went out uh, out on that site, you'll notice that there is a pretty substantial uh, slope off of the site towards that other wetland. There's actually a section of it that's it's basically a cliff. Um, yes. That, you know, as far as the migratory path, that probably wouldn't be preferable for the amphibians. Yeah, not right over that rock, that's for sure. But if they're living anywhere there, I mean, they could still migrate through the neighborhood. Uh, you, have to, you have to think about, they're not out in the daytime during regular business hours. They're out <laughs> at, at night on rainy nights when it's like 40 to 50 degrees. It's not usually a place people are at, at the same yeah. time. So they could move, move back and forth across the yards, but I'm just I was suggesting that if the, if there was a way to perhaps relocate those infiltration galleys and, and make that area a little bit uh, a larger buffer along that mm -hmm. property boundary. Hey, Scott, can I just uh, just a quick question, just getting to the northern, reading the report and you talked about, you know, focusing on the northern part. I, I have to say that that I think that that um, among the conservation commission, it seemed to us that the that we were obsessing more with with the proximity of lot two. And John, if you want to use your pointer, that's always really helpful. You know, the uh, we were focusing more on the. You know, I think we had spent a lot of our effort talking about lot two, and because that's the lot that was closest to the wetland. And you kind of the report kind of introduces the possibility that maybe lot two. And I'll ask you this, you know, in, in your opinion, is our, you know, is our obsession with lot two because it's close, a little bit misplaced and is really, should we be more sweating lot three and this configuration? That's really kind of what I, you know, it's, it, I'm just wondering whether we are, uh, whether we were putting our effort in the wrong place. I don't think so. I mean, every, every piece of uh, upland buffer is really worth protecting uh, to, to some degree, uh, none more than another, but okay. the, closer, the closer to the wetland, uh, the, the better, uh, because, uh, I, and I like to see that alcove that's been pulled back with the retaining wall, that's, that's a good thing for sure. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, it's just another option to provide some additional retained forested habitat uh, within within the site. Um, it seemed obvious along that northern side since they're obviously they're, they're keeping it back there for for other reasons. Uh, but 
I think it could be a, another good option to expand the forest preservation a little bit more. So, but, sorry, Scott, go ahead. But a lot too, you know, I, I see that as being valuable too. Um, and, and it's hard to, it's hard to make a judgment as which one's more valuable. So John, to Scott's point about the infiltration chambers on lot three, they were, were they in front of the building, uh, the house in, at one point? Um, I don't believe so. Could they be moved to the side or more towards the front in some way? And I suppose it's something we can um, take a look at. Um, Grade-wise, it, it made more sense to have them in the backyard where there's some a slight fill or we're kind of close to the existing ground. Uh, inside of that. But that would also require a reduction in that backyard, correct? If you're going to open that up to a wider uh, forested area. Right. right now, the land above those chambers, that's, that's proposed to be just lawn, correct, John? I'm sorry. Yes, that was proposed to be a lawn area with the chambers buried underneath. Correct. Yeah, and just to make my point again clear is that it's not the chambers that are the problem. It's just the, right. the yard expansion. The yard itself, right, right, but by relocating the chambers, you could cut back on that backyard and, and provide more undisturbed area. Right. I mean, I guess that's where we get, you know, there's no, what I'm hearing, there's no, okay, right now we have about a 60 foot um, wide undisturbed area on that northern uh, property line, which is pretty substantial. Um, you know, again, you may not think it's substantial, but you know, from a, a land area perspective, it's quite a bit of the lot. And, you know, if we're talking about moving that some, we're not talking about moving it 100 feet. You know, we may be talking about moving it five to 10 feet to get you know, to go from 60 to 65 or to 70. And is that not the direction that the commission would like us to go? Um, Scott, would 15 feet make a difference, a 10 feet, Scott? Every little bit, every little bit helps. Yeah, it certainly wouldn't hurt. Yeah, I think that's the answer. Well, also, there's plenty, I mean, there's plenty of room around the front and the side of the house for, I mean, lawn, right? Um, hey, John, can you just use your cursor to show where this, this specific 15 foot, what, what the proposal is, just so we know? It would be, okay, it would be up at the very northern end, trying to yeah. just put it just trying to keep, to, to have a little bit more separation. Okay, thank you, I appreciate you doing that. Right, that, that right now, what we're showing the limit work is about 60 feet um, at the closest point. And, you know, we start to get into, um, with the infiltration units, you know, you like to keep them obviously away from the foundation or the basement, you don't know, want that part of getting into the, the house. So, you know, there are some setbacks that we're, we're trying Observe and okay. There is a, a little bit of room in there that we could pull that back, back some. Um, but again, it starts to come down to, you know, where's the limit? Is it 10 feet? Is it 15 feet? Is it 20 feet? Well, no one really knows. So, um, you know, at some point, it's got to make the decision's got to be made. Is this, is we feel like this is enough? I mean, obviously, in this case, more is always better. <coughs> <laughs> also have to look at it in terms of the regulatory standpoint. And I don't know any provision in the Wetlands Protection Act that um, we would need to create this buffer. What are those chambers sized for? I know we've asked this before, but I don't remember what the answer was. What type of event? On that property, on lot three. 
I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Yeah, John, the chambers on lot three, what type of uh, storm event are they sized for? Um, they're, they're part of the integral. We looked at this um, from a stormwater standpoint as the entire site. So they're, they're not designed necessarily for a specific storm. I believe um, those were designed um, to essentially contain the 100 year storm. Uh, and that had to deal with in looking at the, the volume that was the increase in, to reduce the increase in volume uh, from the site. And John, did you say that there's room in the front of the house for that? Or on the uh, west, west side of the house? Yeah. I, I, think, I think the issue is not not so much room as great, um, great. because as, as you as we've, we've talked about before it the groundwater is very cl fairly close to the surface here so any kind of infiltration we would do um, needs to have some separation from that and that would also mean that you know just take an example if we did it on the side of the house now we're looking at filling over that area we may actually have to go closer to the wetlands in that area um, to accommodate the grading that would be required to get the cover over those units. Yeah, I can't read the, um, the grade shots on my screen. I, I really don't know what they are. Um, Where, where's the closest test pit for that one? Is that the one that's in front of the house or to the south of the house? Yeah, that would be the closest test pit, correct. Because yeah, there's a lot of rock out there. There certainly is. There is. Move it around a little bit. But, you know, if there's no test pit right where they're shown, there could be rock there right underneath the surface. It's hard to say. No, and, and you know, there may be some adjustment of the location once we get out there and, and actually start digging. Yeah. Just, I'm just looking at it from a, you know, basically across the site, um, you know, refusal was down roughly about three feet, you know, fairly consistently. So, you know, looking at the ground topography over there, um, you know, assuming it's, it's down three feet, now we're going to end up filling to get over those chambers in that area. That's all. Yeah. But it also looks like there's less trees. If we look where the chambers are now. And the edge of the proposed yard there, there's a cluster of trees. If we were to move the edge of the yard back to save those trees and then move the chambers around closer to the house, around the corner, whatever. That might be a, a line in the sand you could draw at least to say, okay, well, that makes sense. If it's five feet or 10 feet around those trees and or to save a few, few more of those trees, that would be one way to line it up. Yeah, we, I mean, we can certainly, certainly re, reinvestigate lot three a little more um, and, and see if that, that's not a possibility. I like, I like that idea. idea. I mean, I think really lot three is our only option for any additional uh, mitigation. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> So the option on the table would be that that would be would be that we would keep the lot to that piece of property by you know that uh, you know between the retaining wall that, that was that John identified and then and then create some additional uh, um, no disturb on lot three as a means of 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 you know, trying, you know, this sort of as a, as a compromise position here. Yes, that is. Scott, that we're talking. Scott, what do you think about, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, um, I mean, I mean, everything is, I mean, the more, the more, the better. And I guess, yeah, I guess my point would be that uh, um, um, I'd be interested in your opinion and whether that. Yeah. I mean, it, it 
it'd be good to set that. Here's the edge of the yard, in the and and that's uh, going to be the edge of the yard. You know, there might be some other places that aren't going to be graded. They don't need to cut down the trees, like along the western side of the driveway. Is that going to be graded to lot three? You know, there's a whole cluster of trees in there too. Mm -hmm. But I know you have a list of trees that are going to be cut mm -hmm. down, and I wasn't sure mm -hmm. if, are those all going to be cut too. And, mm -hmm. um, so, John, the fact that we had maybe obsessed with, with I mean, I guess, assuming there's going to be a house on lot two, you've done about as much as you can do, I think. Um, so let's put that. But is it fair to say that maybe there is some uh, there is some further wiggle room on lot three where we weren't focusing as uh, as uh, intensely? Does that sound right to you that you might be able to uh, make an accommodation there? Yeah, I can definitely take another look at, at, at lot three and, and okay. minimize it a little more. That'd be great. I think that's an excellent approach. Yes. Um, any other questions any of the members have? I just want to say, Scott, thank you. That was a great analysis, and um, yeah, you, the, your 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 perspective is it was very welcomed here, and it was very helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. I yeah, agree. Totally. Thank you. Your yeah, expertise. I do too. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, any, any other comments or questions from the members? No, I have no further questions. There are some uh, public uh, participants out there. Um, I'll open it up for any questions from the public, if there are any. I don't think so at this time. Hi, Scott. Scott, with respect to Lot 3, I assume that there's going to be a substantial amount of blasting that will go on. Is it? Is that been looked at at all? I didn't review anything related to blasting. Is John, the, there is blasting on lot three, correct? Yes. So I guess my question is, does, what does that? How does how, how does that? What what variable does that? What what what? How does that change the equation? Do you want me to answer that? Please. Please. Scott, yeah, let, let me give you some flavor. We, Scott, we did talk about this previously, and you know, one idea we had was to um, put some, um, you know, some stakes inside the wetlands and monitor the water levels because one of, one of our concerns was when you start blasting, you may change the structure of the soils, you may do something to the underlying rock and change the hydrology in the area. So that's where you know we're thinking of conditioning. Uh, this to have that uh, preliminary survey done, you know, baseline survey before the work is started and then looking. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that or any concerns that we may have missed. Yeah, I've been involved in projects where that question has come up in the past uh, and I really don't have any concerns about how that blasting would affect this particular wetland. It's, it's a much, it's a fairly large extensive wetland uh, and the blasting up on the hill, I think it would be a very long shot that it would affect the hydrology of the wetland, but you could monitor it over time and see what the water levels are like. The problem is, is that water levels fluctuate from month to month and from year to year anyway. So it's hard to tell if, unless you're really going to do some long-term monitoring. But I have done that sort of thing before where we've done extensive surveys to find out if the population of amphibians, what it's like before they do the blasting, and then what it's like after they do the blasting. So there are ways to monitor it, but in this case, based on the proximity of the work and the extensiveness of the wetland, it's usually more of a concern in my experience where it's a very small wetland and an upland where they're doing the work very close by. Uh, a lot of blasting and drilling and that sort of thing. This doesn't fit that criteria. Okay, that's helpful. Um, any other questions or comments from the public? No. 
All right, so John will be looking to continue this to the May 14th uh, meeting. And you're gonna you'll take a look at um, whatever you can do to reconfigure lot three, um, whether it's relocating the infiltration chambers or uh, moving them differently or moving the house differently or whatever, and see what you can do there for us. Is there anything else we would like John to look at? The only other question I have is, are the trees to be taken down marked on any plans? And, you know, can you just maybe highlight the trees that will, will remain, um, you know, during the project? Because like Scott was saying, up in those areas on lot three where the infiltration is planned, that's going to save a substantial amount of trees. I just want to make sure that that gets documented. Well, good point. We've discussed this before, and the the you know we painstakingly went out there and located every tree over six six inches and over within the hundred foot buffer, which is no small task. And they're all labeled on this plan with their size and their height. We also have indicated the limit of work line. So as I stated previously, anything outside of that limit of work line is anticipated to be saved. And this, this is a document, you can go back to this, this plan and see, hey, this tree was on this side of the limit of work line and should have been saved. So your limit of work line is gonna be revised based on this, this plan revision? Correct. Okay. But that's fine, I just wanted to reflect. I just need a way to account for the trees that are not being taken down now, that's all. And sounds yeah. like changing that limit of work line. Right. Us. We understand that everything inside that limit of, is, is staying and everything outside won't be, right? Right. Where is that limit of work line right now uh, up at that northern boundary? You can just point to it. You'll see it's it's, it's labeled L O W. Oh, there it is. Okay. Right there, yeah. So if that's moved. Yeah, there'll be a dozen of trees saved in that area, it appears. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we did we did look at this, you know, if you look in that area, I don't know why I cannot zoom with this thing, but um, in that area where that lawn is, there there was not a lot of of those larger trees. Um, for whatever reason, that area tend to open up a little bit. Um, so, you know, in terms of preserving trees, um, that area was not as 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 important. But, you know, it was brought up in terms of the corridor, so we'll take another look at it. Okay. Is there anything else for John? Okay. Um, John, thank you. Uh, Scott, thank you. We're going to move on. Um, so the next item actually is uh, continued. The 730 DEP 313-585, which is 610 Salem Street, has been continued. Um, so really, we're off to other business now. Um, public is welcome to stay on if they'd like. Um, so let's see, we have DEP 313-591, which is the Borings in Reedy Meadow. Uh, there is a request for minor modification. There is a request to do additional boring or borings um, that was sent out to us. Um, anybody have any questions or comments about that? Oh, sorry, somebody's raising a hand. Are you waving goodbye? <laughs> goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good to see you. All right, so any questions about the request for minor modifications? They just moving boring locations? They're adding, uh, they're adding an additional location, I believe, right? Yes. Atlanta, Judy? Yes, they are. Is it, it was one additional? It was one. When they get out there, they realize they need another one. Right. So can I ask, our, just as a formality, I'd like to ask our experts, do you, um, Elaine and Judy, do you see that this is in any way, shape, or form controversial? No. OK. 
and nor do I, but I, but I do want to make sure that, uh, but your opinion means more than my opinion. So. <laughs> Not true. The motion to. Uh, Not true is right. I agree. Pardon me? Not true. No. Um, so should we make a motion to, um, do we have to make a motion to accept the modific to accept the minor modification? Okay. So minor mod yep. I'd like to make a motion to accept the minor modification. All right, we have a motion. Anybody second that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You raise your hand. You said you could raise your hand. There is, but now that there is a hand, I'm going to try it. Raise hand. Raise uh, hand. Does that do it? Does that do anything? Yep. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. So, Nini, I see a yes. Peter, yes. I don't. How do you do that? I, I, I don't show on my anymore. show on your phone. Does it show on the hosts it, or? You have to press participate. I got it now. On the bottom it says raise hand. Right. Yeah. No, I raised my hand. I just didn't know if it did anything. Um, yeah, but you know what? As the host, I don't have the little hand. Uh, but you, you know, thing. get to see if people. How do you, how do you see people raise their hand? I can see it two ways. I can see it on a box that pops up, and I can see it on your individual window. Oh, okay. Unless, so the host gets you get you get the lowdown. So when we raise our hands, we we can't, we can't see, tell. We can't yeah. tell. So you are you are in possession. So whatever you can just make up whatever you <laughs> see. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, right now, let the wreckage show. Make these go a lot smoother. <laughs> uh, so yes, let the record show. Actually, Frank, uh, are you voting? And Teresa, are you voting? I'll, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. I, I did, a, I did a, a physical one. All right, so let the record show that we have four uh, you know, votes for yes. And I will add. Oh, I see it now. You're showing it now. I see that raised hand. I like that. Yeah, and I will add the fifth. So it is unanimous. Uh, <laughs> The move, you know, it stands as a minor modification. Okay, uh, next business is 14 Wiley Street, discuss drainage issue. Uh, we did get something sent around from uh, Judy uh, or Elaine. And I believe they want to install a French drain. Is that the? Correct. Jimmy went out and took a look. Um, he doesn't think it's going to help because it's underwater. underwater. Right. Yeah, we saw the photo. Right, by the fence. Right, right, where it's pooling. Right. Yeah, I'm in agreement also based on the water levels in that area. Um, you know, it's not going to hurt them to put one in, but I just don't think it's going to be very effective. Uh, what are they looking for us on that? A letter saying, okay? Pretty much. They just wanted to run it by the commission because she feels like she's had more water over the last two years. I think, yeah, I think everybody has. Which, right, right. I mean, she's so close to the river. I, yeah, she is. Uh, I mean, that flooding came under the fence and into the yard. Right. Where was it she was proposing the French drain? She didn't say. I mean, right along the, where the picture was, right there somewhere. She thinks that since um, it's increased from the pool, and I guess there's a hot tub on the neighbor's yard. But the pool's been there for a long time. I, I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that would have an impact. I mean, no. it's been holding water. No. no. Um, I mean, there's no, really no good solution. I don't think so. No. True, in that whole area of town, actually. Um, Right. All right, so yeah, um, I mean, I don't see an issue adding a French drain. I don't know how effective it'll be, if at all. Right. Um, so do we need to vote on that or? Um, I can draft a letter and I'll send it around. Okay. And then I can bring it by and have you sign it. Or I can just sign your name. All right, so we should probably vote anyways, just to- Sure, yep. Um, to issue the letter. Yeah, issue a letter saying we approve of installation of a French drain at uh, 14 Wiley Street. We yes, do want to know specifics. You know, we would like to know where she's locating it. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess the question is, uh, how would she be taking that drain? Are they bringing an excavator in, a mini excavator? Are they doing it by hand? 
I don't they could do it by hand. I that's yeah. not I don't think that's a tough I said do I have a motion? I, I so moved. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Oh wait. Hi. I found it. No, no, wait. I have to, oh, my hand stayed raised. I, I never lowered it. My hand it. stayed raised. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let the record show I do see four uh, affirmatives. And I will also add my fifth in. Oh, Peter voted. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, had to unvote, I had to unvote from the last time. So yes, I you voted. did. Yes, we had to unvote with this. <laughs> All right. Hands down. Hands down, yes. Yes. Um, All right. Is there anything else, Judy yes. or Elaine, yes. that we need to discuss? Yeah, yes. zero Greenwood Street. Oh yeah, 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 Miss, Mr. Liu. Yep. Um, so I can't tell. Did he move it further away from from the um, from the neighbor? But but further away from the, from the water from the from the uh, closer to the stream. I know. So how is that neighbor. good for us? Because the stream winds on that end. No, it's. What was approved under the order of conditions um, was a setback of 12.4 feet. And then it so went that, up to... Uh, at, at, the, at the closest point of, of the house, it was going to be 12.4 feet under the order of conditions. Right. So and then it went up to like 30 something feet, right? It went up to um, 43.5. And now and it's back and to... 35.1. Yeah. So it's still going to be a, a huge difference over what was approved under the order of conditions. Right. And it'll allow him to put more plantings in on that. I'm end. sorry, can you just repeat? So what, what is it now? So it was 12 to 40. What is it now? Under the order of conditions, it was 12.4 feet. And then he moved it. So it was going to be 43.5 feet. So now he didn't, now it's going to be 35.1. He moved it back. A little. So it's about two and a half times farther than the original um, Under the order of conditions. Order of conditions. Correct. Seems good. Yeah, and he just needed the letter because he got the variance from the Board of Appeals, but one of the conditions was any change. It had to adhere to the commission's and, plan. Had to be approved by us, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. So is this a request for a minor modification or is it just informal? It's just, it's a minor modification. So it'll just be a letter issuing. Okay. All right. So we should still make take a vote on that. Yes. So do I have a motion to uh, issue a minor modification for zero Greenwood? So moved. Second. I'll second it. Okay. Oh. Uh, get your voting buttons going, everybody. <laughs> I think I'm still my hand is still up. <laughs> Good at this now. All right. So let's try could show that I do have four affirmatives. Uh, on that motion, and I will add a fifth to uh, issue the letter. Very good. Do we have any other business? Nope. No. Elaine, anything? No, I have nothing more to add. Thank you. Oh, there is one more thing. Um, Gertrude Spalding Park, they want to start the work on that. So they're having a Zoom um, meeting tomorrow. I saw in the email late this afternoon that they invited Jimmy. So I don't know if you want to go to a Bob or if someone else wants to. I can send you the email. Yeah, sure. Uh, send me the email. Um, okay. What time is that tomorrow? Um, I don't know. Yeah, send me the uh, email. I, yeah, I will. I am going to be on the road at some point. I'm not it's sure. It's probably in the morning. Okay. I'll see if I can join. I'm not sure if I will be able to. I do have some work uh, calls tomorrow. Okay. And then I'll be on the road at some point. Um, and I, I heard from Leah and she wants, you saw the email, she wants to come to dinner. We have one for Jimmy. No, I didn't see that email. Oh, maybe she sent it to me. Uh, um, what did you say, Judy? You said Leah? Yeah, if um, well, we have a, a dinner for Jimmy, she wants to come. Okay, she'll probably invite Dave too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. In about three years when we can go to a restaurant. Yeah, when we can see each other again in person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we, do we don't want to do a Zoom dinner. No pain. 
<laughs> well, we could ask uh, Jimmy to have a cookout, and we could all stay six feet apart. There you go. <laughs> That'll work. Anything else from anybody out there? No? No, I think that's good. So the it's next meeting is the 14th, and it'll be by Zoom as well. Right. 14th, okay. I've got to say it works pretty well. I, I would give you remarkably well, I thought, yeah. We, we got better as it went all, you know, went along and then uh, learned how to raise our hands. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about the thing that was getting me was the gallery view. And what I realized is that when documents are being, um, right. are being put on the screen, you don't have the option of gallery. You can't supersede that turns off gallery view. Right, right. That, right. So I kept looking to see where the, you were talking about that and I couldn't find it. And then when the document got taken down, the gallery sign. Right. Showed. So actually I can put it on now. It's well, kind of, I just it realized does, the Brady. It does kind of remind you of the Brady bunch, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, definitely does. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I will send you that email. I have a button I can mute everybody if I want. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Well, not, nice seeing you all. Yeah, nice seeing you uh, too. I haven't seen you on the train lately. I know. Forget about that train, Judy. Next time, you got to show your face. I I know because I had to keep looking down to take notes, so it was hard. <laughs> all right, and and Mimi, I don't know about you, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, no worries. Um, I'm you gotta show your face. DJ, so sorry about that. All right, you gotta show your face. <laughs> we know we know who's in their pajamas and <laughs> we know who didn't wash their hair. You know, <laughs> not get a haircut. Right. We can't get a haircut, not unless oh, you. God, I know. That's you right. That's go right. To tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> get a quick haircut and a tattoo. All right, right. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> stay safe, please. You right? too. All right, you too. Take Bye -bye. care, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.